Oh, hello everybody, and welcome back to Samyuzang Edinburgh, albeit virtually. It's going on for a bit longer than I thought, but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm so glad that we can do this. And uh, yes, here we are at the door to Dharma. Um, I'm hoping that some of you, if not all of you, will have will have had a look at, uh, will be coming to this from the um, the course that we did previously, which is the Discovering Buddhism course, um, because it all follows on. Don't worry if you didn't do it, it still will make sense, but uh, ideally it would be good to do it in that way. Anyway, before we step through the door to Dharma, let's, um, let's say the refuge prayer together, and I'll just remind you by saying it in English first, and then we'll say the Tibetan phonetics to make the connection with the uh, Kaju Lamas. So, in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Noble Sangha, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. Through the virtue generated by the practice of generosity and other virtues, may I achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. Uh, so we'll say the Tibetan verse three times. O Sanje Cho Tang Suji Cho Nam La Chang Cho Padu Dani Chap Sun Chi Dagi Jin So Ji Pe Sonam Ji Dora Pinche Sanje Do Par Sho Sanje Cho Tang Suji Cho Nam La Chang Cho Padu Dani Chap Sun Chi Dagi Jin So Ji Pe Sonam Ji Dola Penche Sanje de Par Show Sanje Cho Tang Suji Cho Nam La Chang Cho Padu Dani Chap Sun Chi Dagi Jin Soji Pe So Nam Ji Dola Penche Sanje de Par Show And then we'll say the um, the aspiration for all beings, it's called like the four boundless thoughts. Uh, in English first, and, and then once in the Tibetan phonetics. So, may all beings have happiness and create the causes of happiness. May they all be free from suffering and from creating the causes of suffering. May they find that noble happiness that can never be tainted by suffering. And may they attain universal, impartial compassion beyond worldly bias towards friends and others. O Sam Chen Tam Che Dewa Tang, Dewe Jutan Dempa Jurchik, Dunyao Tang Dunya Chi Jutan Trawa Jurchik, Dunyao Mepi Dewa Tampa Tang Mindrawa Jurchik, Nearing Chadang Tang Trawe Tang Yom Chempola Nepa Jurchik. Paden Sawe Lama Rinpoche, Dagi Chiwo Pende de Shukla, Katrin Chempo Goneji Sungte, Kusun Tuchi Nodub Sautu So. So that, that last prayer was uh, to my root guru. And I think from here on in, we will say that prayer if you would like to say that prayer. But of course, it really makes sense for those of you who have a guru, but otherwise you can still visualize that the Buddha, but so maybe in the next course we'll, we'll include that one as well. So, first of all, just say a few words about the course itself. So I think having glimpsed something of the history and the relevance of Buddhism in our lives and the, the uh, the dis the, through the Discovering Buddhism course, I think we're now standing, it feels like we're standing at the threshold for the door to Dharma. And um, so the aim of, of the course is to prepare us for any further teachings, for, for actually treading the, the path of Dharma. So, so far, you know, the Discovering Buddhism course is more kind of um, research, you know, to kind of set, uh, give, give some basic understanding to set the, um, the framework of, of our personal path. And now it gets more and more personal because Buddhism is about us. The Dharma is about us. It's about our mind, getting to know ourselves, getting to know our mind for the benefit of ourselves, but also 
for the benefit of others. If you're coming from a position of knowledge and understanding and experience, that's going to benefit all those that you come into contact with as well as yourself. So it's like we're standing on the threshold about to about to walk the walk, if you like. So far, we've been mainly talking the talk. And so it's like as if we're about to set out on a, a great journey. And um, we need to have the right provisions, we need to have the right resources and equipment before we set out. Of course, our journey, we're not actually physically moving somewhere geographically. We're, we're, it's an inward journey. It's a, you could say it's a journey into inner space. Our minds are uh, relatively unknown to us. It's strange, isn't it? The way that we, we, we kind of talk about my mind, but uh, we don't really understand or know our minds. I think sometimes also we get confused about between the difference between mind and brain. You know, there's they're not at all the same thing. Brain is kind of like the machinery, if you like, the computer or something, but it's not the transmitter. So, um, so we, we need to explore that. But before we set out on a journey, we need to clear the path of any obstacles, or at least start to clear the path of any obstacles. And of course, the, the obstacles I'm talking about are in our mind. And so, but the thing is that these obstacles are what are our kind of misconceptions, our lack of understanding, you could say. And because of our lack of understanding or, or not understanding correctly, it changes the way we see things. It distorts the way we see things. It's a little bit like as if you have um, a dirty window, then everything through the window is going to be distorted. It's not going to be clear. So what we need to do is, is be able to identify where, where these uh, obstacles are, where these obstructions are, and get rid of them. Actually, you don't need to do anything other than understand them because it's through not understanding that, that they're there in the first place. They're not part of our intrinsic nature. They're just part of, the, it's like they're not part of the window, it's just something that's landed on the window, some dust that's obscuring the view. So it's like that. But because it's to do with ignorance or deluded way of seeing something, then as soon as you do see that through it, then you, there's no going back. You, you've understood it. And so it, it clears by itself because you've understood something. And so we progress in that way. Of course, it's not always easy to see. You know, we can, it's very easy for us to see other people's flaws, but not quite so much to see our own, um, which is why it's, it's very good to have a, a, a good authentic teacher because um, then you know, he or she can help with that. And, uh, and, and point out your flaws. And, and uh, you know, a genuine Lama should, should definitely be, that's one of the main things they do. And it's not to criticize you or, or make you feel bad about yourself, quite the opposite, it's to help you. And it's a bit like, um, you know, if you, if you had some spinach stuck on your tooth, would you rather somebody pointed it out and then you could get rid of it? Or, or, they, or they, for fear of offending you, they didn't point it out and then you're walking around with spinach all day <laughs> on your teeth. So, so it's like that, you know, we shouldn't feel, uh, feel like offended if, if, if the teacher points it out. But of course, in, in many instances, we can see ourselves if we look at ourselves really honestly. And so, the Dharma has many skillful ways and methods to enable us to identify what needs to be corrected in our thought, in our speech, and in our conduct. Of course, the thought is the hardest one. You know, the speech, usually if you've said something unkind, for example, you soon realize it. Or if you've behaved in a, in a negative way, you probably will realize it. But the mind is more tricky, it's more subtle. So that's where we really have to focus and put a lot of energy to see where, where because really the speech and, the, and, the, uh, and the, what the body does and what the speech does only follows from the direction of, of the mind. It's the mind that's in the driving seat, isn't it? So that's like the root cause of where we need to, uh, to really put our attention. So 
if we're honest with ourselves, if we listen well to the teachings, uh, whether we're hearing them or reading, studying, in whichever way we're receiving the Dharma, and then we need to really reflect on it, you know, not just um, say you go to some teachings, you hear this wonderful teaching, and then that's the end of it. No, that's not going to work. Oh, let's then have the next teaching and the next teaching. You need to reflect on each teaching that you hear or read because they're very profound and they, you need to really take them on board, not just tick them off like a bucket list or something, you know. So we need to really use our, our intelligence and if we, if we really listen well and reflect, and then after that we also need to meditate on them because then that's when they really kind of sink in. So after you've studied and then and then reflected, contemplated, you can say, and then just sit with it, meditate, not trying, just allowing it to sink in. It's like um, eating the food, not just looking at it, but you're actually taking it in. It becomes part of you. And then you can apply whatever your realization is, whatever your understanding is, then you apply it in your life. That's what it's for. So, like I said, we're not just talking the talk, we're actually walking the walk, we're doing it, we are it. It's become part of us. Another thing we can do is to um, study the liberating lives of the great masters. That's a, such a, a great cause of, uh, for, for inspiration and, and, and examples. We touched on it in the Discovering Buddhism course, especially, um, well, the first two were very much about the life of the Buddha. So, of course, you're taking the Buddha's life as, as an example. There's no better example. But there's many of the, of the later realized masters, and we did touch on it. We, had, we mentioned Tilopa and Naropa, the Indian Mahasiddhas, and then the beginnings of the Kaju lineage from, from Marpa, the translator, to Milarepa, the great yogi, and then to Gampopa, who sort of melded the yogic tradition with the monastic tradition and was really the very start of the monastic Kaju lineage. And then from him, you know, all the Kamapas, from the Dusam Champa to the, the, the present Kamapa, his home is the 17th Kamapa. So all of these masters, that, you know, there's literature on them. You can, you can uh, the ones that are living, obviously you can, you can hear them, but, uh, or you can read about them. And when I say liberating lives, we're not just talking about, oh, they did this and they did that and then they did that and then they went here and that. We're talking about the example of, of their Dharma lives, not just like a biography. But, well, a bit more of a spiritual biography, you could say. So that's the point of it. So you're looking at, you know, what, what they did in that respect, how, how they studied, how they, the, the hardships they went through, the realizations they, they had, the enlightenment, they, they were able to become fully enlightened. So the, these are really uh, very um, inspirational stories. And they're there to show us that we can also do that. It might seem very distant or something, but these are human beings, you know, and so it, it shows, that's why they, it's so important to, um, to read their stories and so enjoyable and, and um, yeah, it, it really sort of gives you some fuel for, the, for your journey, if you like. And so also the other thing about the liberating lives is when you, when you appreciate what they've done, then you, you, know, they, you start to develop trust and from that trust is also the seed of faith. But it's not just blind faith because somebody said something. It's actually because you're starting to really feel it, because you, you appreciate what they did. And so then the, the, you, can't, you can start to cultivate that faith. It just happens naturally. It starts to blossom. And, uh, and so it's based on, on your knowledge, on your reason, your experience. Of course, you can also proceed through doubt. You don't have to just take things on board just because you've read it. You need to test things for yourself. You know, is it like that? How does it work? You know, you, know, you, you proceed in that way um, so, that, so that you're really using your intelligence to examine things, not just to swallow them because you, somebody with a high title told you something or, you know, you just, you just really need to make it real for you. 
however much you might admire the person, you still need to take it on board for yourself. So you need to you dispel any doubts through reason, through intelligence, and opening your eyes, opening your heart, opening your mind, just opening everything. And then, as a result of that, you'll be able to apply it in your life. You know, it's not just about learning a dry academic subject to get a qualification or something. You know, this is for you, it's for your life, for future lives. We'll go there another time maybe, but we can say, say future lives also for your death. It's in, for everything that we're going to experience, the Dharma is for everything. And so when you start to see the, the daily benefits that you have, maybe you just see a little bit, you, you're kind of kinder to yourself, kinder to others, or, or you know, you start to understand more, you start to be able to function better in the world as well, you know. And so when you start to see some benefits happening, it's, it, gives you, um, it gives you confidence. And um, yeah, it, it, it gives you a, a love of the Dharma. You start to really appreciate it and treasure it. Of course, it, it comes with time, you know. It's, it, it, the thing with the Dharma is it's showing you how things really are beneath the superficial ex, uh, sort of appearances of how they might seem to be, but how they really are. And the more you understand, the, the, the clearer things become. And of course it takes time. It's not a quick fix, nor is it easy. Nothing worthwhile is easy. You have to put some effort in. If you, that's another thing you can learn from the, the Buddha's life and from the, from the lives of the great masters. They put a lot of effort in. That's why they became liberated. It doesn't just, boo, oh, you're liberated. You have to really, you know, open everything up. It's far harder than doing a degree at university, you know, but so much more worthwhile. Um, yeah, it's like, you know, another metaphor you can say about the Dharma is that uh, the Buddha or the, the great masters are like the, the doctors and the Dharma is like the medicine and we're like the patients. But even the best medicine in the world is only going to work if you take it. If you just leave it gathering dust, it ain't going to work. So. It's up to us, you know, we have to give it our best shot. So, when we listen to the Dharma, you know, we, we need to have res a respectful attitude. Even if you're at home, uh, you're sort of um, listening on the internet or however, you know, um, you, can, you can imagine that you're here in the shrine room or to whatever teaching you're taking, that you're there with, the, with whoever's teaching and that you're sitting respectfully, sort of straighten up your posture, you know, not sort of lounging around, kind of, or lying down even, you know, just perk yourself up, be alert, not eating and drinking, and, you know, just zoning out. You need to give it your full attention. Believe me, you'll need all your attention if you're going to get any kind of understanding. And, uh, and this is, I'm saying this for your sake, you know, not for mine. I'm taking it for mine as well. It's good to remind myself too. So we need to sort of let go of our careless, that casual, too overly casual attitude and adopt mindful awareness. Really perk up your awareness of, of body and your speech and your mind. Okay, so if we give it our best shot, we'll, 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 the more we put in, the more we, we, we get out. So... I thought it would be a good idea to use the Kaju lineage prayer as our guide for this course, as the basis for this course, because it's got everything. Um, and I think um, what we'll do is, oh, I should explain also that this, there's a couple of different versions. Um, and in Tibetan, it's called the Dorji Chang Tungma. And uh, it means like the, 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 the Dorji Chang prayer. Dorji Chang also is, has another name. Well, not another name. And Dorji Chang is Tibetan. But in Sanskrit, he's called Vajradhara. And I'll explain more about that later. But uh, the prayer was uh, composed in the 15th century by a great master called um, Benga Jampo Zangpo. 
And we usually say this prayer, it, we recite it before a Dharma teaching or a meditation session, or can be at any time. And it's not only a prayer, it's, it's an instruction. It's, it starts off as it's a homage, basically, to the lineage masters. And then it's a supplication. We're supplicating the lineage masters, they're asking for their blessing. And then it becomes an aspiration of what we're hoping to uh, achieve, that we can follow in their footsteps, basically. But it's also a very profound instruction on how to meditate and how to behave. Um, it, it, well, we'll go through it verse by verse, but basically it shows us how to practice meditation and also to conduct our, ourselves in, in our daily life by letting go of what's harmful to us or to others, by adopting what's helpful, doing what's helpful to ourselves and, and, and others, and training the mind, which is, of course, where the study and the meditation come in. Now, because it's written from a very high view, from a, by, by a, a very highly realized being, we won't be able to understand all of it straight away. Um, but over time, the, the, as we progress, then, then the meaning reveals itself more and more gradually. Um, and, and so that, that's what happens as we tread the Dharma path. So don't worry if you don't get it all. I'll do my best to explain what I understand, but that is by no means all of it either. So yeah, we'll, we'll go like that. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful prayer, and I think it, it'll keep us on the right track. So before we look, well, there's actually two versions that we're going to use. So the first version, they're the same prayer, but one of them has um, a uh, Tibetan phonetics. So I thought it would be good to say that first, because it was in Tibetan originally, so we should uh, kind of make a connection with the lineage masters. So I think it's only fitting to say it once in the Tibetan. And then we'll go through it verse by verse in the English. Okay. So the first version of the Doji Chang uh, lineage prayer, Doji Chang Tungma, we'll say it together. Um, I won't say the English at this point because we'll be going through it all in English. And we're not going to be chanting it, we're just going to say it um, in, recite it. Udo je chang chen che lo na ro chang ma pa mi la chu je gam po pa du sum she che kun chen ka ma pa che shi jung je du pa se nam chang ji tak sa sum pa den ru pa so sa blam cha ja che la kang ye pe ya me ru gan dak po ka ju la so an deb so ka ju la ma nam jut pa sin u nam cha chin ji lo shen lo kom ji kam pa sung pa shen sen u kun la chak shen me pa tang sen de de tak chu pe kom chen la ne ko shen pa me pa chin ji lo me gu kom ji ko wo sung pa shen Menga te gu je pe la ma la, jun du sa wan de pe gom chen la, chu min mu gu che wa chin ji lo, yang me gom ji ng shi sung pa shin, ka sha to pe ng wo so ma te, ma chu te ka jok pe gom chen la, gom cha lu tang tra wa chin ji lo, Nam to ngu wo sung pu sung chu ko sung pa shin chi yang ma yin che yang char wa la manga ro pa char we gom chen la ku de ya me to pa chin ji lo che wa kun tu yan da la ma tang chal me chu chi a pa la long chu ching sa tang lam ji an ten rab zu ne do je changi kompang nyur tob sho. Okay, so, uh, so now we're connected. 
We can go through the English text verse by verse. And for that, we'll use this translation. And um, this actually says at the top, brief Vajradhara prayer. So as I was explaining before, Vajradhara is Dorji Chang. Dorji Chang is Vajradhara. Vajradhara is just Sanskrit. Dorji Chang is Tibetan. So, we should also familiarize ourselves with the Kaju lineage refuge tree because there are depictions of all the, the, um, the lineage masters that we're going to be referring to. They're all pictured in the refuge tree or on the refuge tree. And the very central figure on the refuge tree it's, it's like the, the tree of, of all the beings to whom we, we're paying our respects and uh, taking refuge with. And so the very central figure is Vajradhara or Dorji Chang. And so he is depicted as um, in, in, a, in a kind of human-like form. <clears throat> but unlike all the other beings, in the, uh, in the, on the refuge tree, he's actually a prime, the, the primordial Buddha. He's the state of Buddhahood, if you like. So not any particular incarnation, so it's not, it doesn't look like Shakyamuni Buddha, who, who, who was a human incarnation of Buddha, but he's, it's, it's Dharmakaya, it means like the, the mind of the Buddha. But of course you can't see the mind of the Buddha, so they, there is a, a depiction, which is why he's blue. So he's blue because blue is kind of like the color of space. So he's not a, a human being. Like, he's, he's the mind of the Buddha. He, she the, doesn't have a, a sex as such, but, but he's depicted like a, a, a Buddha, like a prince with all the accoutrements, but we sh should understand him as the mind of the Buddha. And when we have a root guru, someone who is our own lama, we, we depict, we picture the, the root lama, whoever it is, whichever human lama that we have, whichever human teacher we have, but in the form of Vajradhara. If we don't have a, 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 a root guru or someone that we relate to in that way, then we just picture the, what, what the, the, the uh, representation of, uh, of Buddha in that form of, with, uh, with blue and imagine it's like the sky kind of. So, and then all of, all of the beings that we're going to mention and plus many, many more are in the refuge tree. And that would have to probably do another course entirely just about that if we're going to go into it in that kind of detail. But you do need to know that Vajradhara is the middle one and that all the Buddhas and, and Bodhisattvas around him are, are, are all, the lineage all the lineage people. So it starts off, great Vajradhara, great, great, uh, great mind of Buddha, Tilo, which is short for Tilopa, Naro, which is short for Naropa, so great Vajradhara, Tilo, Naro. So at the top of the lineage tree, there is Tilo, Tilopa and Naropa, who were the Indian Mahasiddhas. Very fully realized beings. So you have Vajradhara in the middle, great, great Vajradhara, Tilo, Naro. The next line it says, Marpa. So Marpa, the translator, Tibetan, who went to India, who received teachings from Naropa, and others, other Indian masters, and who came back to Tibet and who passed the teachings on to the next one, Mila, Milarepa, and other students as well, but Milarepa was the, the main one. So Mapa, Mila, Dharma Lord Gampopa, who was the pupil of Mila. And he's called Dharma Lord Gampopa because he was the first monastic one 
and he was the one, as we said before, that, that sort of was the confluence of both the monastic tradition and the yogic practice. To, uh, Kadju tradition, it, it was really gave birth to the, the Kadju tradition as we know it now. So we're paying homage to great Vajradhara, the primordial mind of Buddha, Tilo, he's the source of everything, then Tilopa, Naropa, Mapa, Mila, Milarepa, Dharma Lord Gampopa. Then the next line, knower of the three times, omniscient Karmapa. So in Tibetan, that's Dusum Chempa, that means knower of the three, the three times, the past, the present, and the future. And that's what his name became, Dusum Chempa the first Kamapa. Then holders of the four elder and eight younger lineages. So from, from these early roots became four, the, the first four, by elder it means the first four lineages, and then from them eight younger lineages, the ones that kind of um, rooted and sprouted off them. And really these lineages were, were, grew around enlightened masters. And so, you know, one would receive the teachings from the previous teacher, and then it might be in a different part of Tibet. All this part now is in Tibet. And then another, another um, offshoot would, would start. But they all have the same Buddha Dharma, but they just have a, have a, a main Lama, the, the, who, uh, fully realized Lama. <coughs> so that's the first verse. That, that first verse is, um, is a not acknowledging and, and name checking it doesn't sound very nice, but but kind of you know paying homage to to these great beings really at the root of of the of the lineage, and then it carries on. Drikung, this is the second verse now. Drikung, Taklung, and the Salpa, glorious Drukpa, and so forth. So these are the four what were referred to as the four elder lineages. So you have the Drikung. Uh, kaju, the Taklung Kaju, the Salpa Kaju, and the Drukpa Kaju. And then you have other ones, but obviously they're not all named one after another. So, so it's just naming these four and so forth, it says there, so the, to understand that there's many others. Masters of the profound path of Mahamudra. So all of these lineages grew up around masters of the profound path of Mahamudra. The Mahamudra is the highest realization, the highest teaching. Right now, it's like we're in the little foothills of Everest, but you have to start in the foothills to get to the top of Everest. So, so the, all these beings that we talk about are, are fully realized Mahamudra. That's just a great seal. So to the Dagpo instruction lineage, Kaju Lamas, I supplicate you, I uphold your lineage. Grant the blessings of your liberating lives. So that means the Dagpo instruction lineage. Dagpo is actually, that's, that's the lineage of, of Gampopa. Um, he, his main seat was in a place called Dagpo, so it became the Dagpo lineage. And sometimes he's like called the Dagpo Lama, something like that but that means Gampopa. So it's, it's through him that we have this lineage, the Dagpo lineage, Karmakadru lineage, the peerless protectors of wanderers. By wanderers, it means all those beings lost in samsara, lost in worldly confusion. It's peerless, beyond compare, protectors of, of, of ordinary be be beings who need that guidance. And then saying, <clears throat> Kaju Lamas, I supplicate you. So you call them all to mind, and then we supplicate them, we, we really earnestly request and say, state that we, we, we will uphold the lineage, we, will be, we respect it, we uphold this lineage, and we supplicate them to grant the blessings of their liberating lives which is what I referred to a little bit earlier on when I said, you know, these, when we hear about these lives, there is great blessing. 
It's not just a story. It's not just like a fairy story. These people really did these things. And if that inspires us, that's, we're open to receive their blessings. I remember Akon Rinpoche, my guru, my, my root lama, <coughs> founder of uh, Samyu Ling and all of the other Samyu Zongs, he once said to me, the lama's blessings are always there. So it's really a question of us being open to receive them. And that's, that's really what we need. That's what we're working on. We, we need to, to be able to open to them. It's like the sun's rays are always there. But if we're sheltering under an umbrella or in a dark room, we don't get them. But if we're in, open beneath the sun, then we get them. Something like that. Excuse me, I just need to have a... So grant, grant us the blessings of your liberating lives. So we've paid homage, we've supplicated them. Now we get to verse 3. Just as revulsion is taught to be the legs of meditation... This meditator, we're talking about ourselves, so this meditator clings not to food and riches and has severed the ties to this life. Grant your blessings for detachment from honor and gain. So let's just unpick that a little bit. Just as revulsion is taught to be the legs of meditation. By legs it means what, what propels it. You know, when you, when you say something's got legs, it means it, it's, it's going somewhere. So revulsion or distaste for, for what? For worldly life, for, for worldly uh, confusion, you could say. When you start to see that all that glitters is not gold, all the things that we've, all the places that we've looked for happiness but never found it, it's not saying that there's something bad about that, but it's our attachment to them that's the problem. That's, that's, the, that's the key. So when we put too much value on money, on, on uh, wealth, on cars, on houses, on whatever the thing is, on partying, and, you know, it's not saying they're intrinsically bad. What's harmful is our over, our putting them too high, our, our being uh, attached to them, attaching too much importance to them. It's not saying you should never enjoy anything good. Oh, well, well, good, say good, uh, enjoyable. You know, you can en still enjoy things. Whatever comes your way is fine. But to put all your efforts into, into these things at the expense of, not putting your efforts what you really need to, where you really need to, where you really will find that lasting happiness and, and release from suffering, then that's really not bright, is it? It's not so intelligent. So the more we see of the kind of uh, beneath the surface in life, you know, you can get to a point where you think, oh, I've done it, you know, I've been there, been done to this party today, I've had so much to drink, and that doesn't make me happy, I've, or I've taken drugs, or whatever the thing is, you know, and then you think, oh, no, I really have had enough of that. that. That's what it means by revulsion, you know, up to here. So just as revulsion, that's the, that starts you to sort of think, okay, there must be something more to life than this. And I think that's how we all start to even look at the Dharma at the beginning. We think well, there must be something more, something greater meaning. So that's what it means here, revulsion or distaste for. Revulsion is quite a strong word, but it kind of wakes you up a bit, doesn't it? Um, but, but, you know, you could say distaste for or start to see the, the downside of, let's say. <clears throat> this meditator, that's you, that's me, that's all of us. This meditator or practitioner clings not to food and riches. The operative word here is clings. It doesn't mean to say you shouldn't have any food. It doesn't mean to say you shouldn't have any riches. 
The problem is the clinging, the grasping. Enjoy your food. Enjoy whatever riches come your way. But don't give it all your energy to get those things. They're not that important. So cling not to food and riches. And now this could sound quite dramatic. And this meditator has, and has severed the ties to this life. Not severed their life. <laughs> We're not about to chop ourselves here. No, we want to, to have a better life. But it's the ties. Again, it's this, the ties that, that bind us to the worldly life they're talking about here, we call samsara in Sanskrit. Is samsara means this, this worldly, deluded way of living. That's what we need to sever, not life, but the, 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 the deluded, confused, looking for things in the wrong place, sacrificing our needs for our wants. So we, we you know, this is what we do all the time, isn't it? We, Capitalism is actually built on that, if we, if we <laughs> get a bit, a bit, a bit uh, controversial here maybe, but hey, <laughs> for a penny, <laughs> literally. Um, it's quite uh, funny actually because the, this, this center used to be a bank, it was built as a bank and it's built in the style of a temple, <laughs> and now it actually is a temple, <laughs> so, but not to Mammon, but to, to Buddha. So. Um, Anyway, not, clings not to food and riches, severed this life, the ties to this life, this life of worldly preoccupations. Because I was saying, you know, it's important that we have what we need, more important than, than what we want. Want, okay. If it comes, it comes. But need is what we, is what we need. So, but look, if you look at how the world is going, what, what does a human being or any, any living being need? They, need? they need clean water, they need air to breathe, they need water to drink, and they need food that grows out of the earth. These three main basic needs are the very things that we're polluting. Our air is polluted, our waters are polluted, and the earth is polluted. Great, that's really intelligent, isn't it? So, if we're using our, our minds more intelligently, more, more, with more understanding, we wouldn't be doing that. So, so this will have, uh, once, once we have this kind of understanding, then, you know, then we won't be sacrificing what we, what we need for, for some baubles that are dangled in front, you know, the latest iPad or whatever it is. Of course, you know, I've got a mobile phone, we all have mobile phones, and there's, there's okay in, in uh, moderation, but not to have those as your prime targets, not to cling to them, they're not the be all and end all. And I think, you know, in this situation of, of COVID-19 and pandemics, you know, is we can learn from this because the, the causes of, of this also is to do with our disregard for nature and for wildlife. Our, our you know, getting out of whack with that and, and uh, treating animals and, uh, as if they're just products for our, you know, laying waste to, to the natural world. So, so it's all, this is what it's talking about here. So, that's when we say sever the ties to this life, it means to the, to the worldly life. And then the last line of the, that verse is to addressing the, the lamas. Grant your blessings for detachment from honor and gain. Now again, that, that's quite hard for us to understand, isn't it? Because we all want to have honor, we want to gain things, you know. It, it thinks like, oh, well, do you want to be dishonored or not gain anything? No, it, it just means that when we say honor, it's like prestige or how people, other people's approval. As long as we know that what we're doing, we're living in the right way, that's, that's what, that, we're the only one that, you know, we have to, uh, and our teacher perhaps as well, you know, definitely, but, but just for worldly honor, that we don't need. 
Actually, that's what makes people proud and puffed up and pompous and all of those things. You don't have to look very far. You just look at the leader of the... the well, I'm not sure when this is going to come out, whether he will still be president in, in, the, in, the, in America. But anyway, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, it's not just him either. So, um, so these, you know, this is, is like people that are just attached to, to, to image, let's say, that kind of honor and, uh, and uh, baubles and awards and all of this stuff. <clears throat> and the same with gain, you know, whatever you gain. It's not saying don't enjoy what comes your way. Do enjoy what comes your way, you know. You might as well, why not? But not to put all your eggs on that basket, not to be going and put all your efforts there at, at the expense of where you should really be putting your efforts. And, you know, whatever honours come your way, that's fine. That's fine. You know, you don't have to say, oh, no, don't honour me, you know. But, but it, it, just don't pay it much value. Okay, so then moving on to, now this is where we start to, um, so the first two, you could say the first two verses were more, the first one was a homage, then you're supplicating the lamas, and then you're asking for their blessings. And now we're going to get into the sort of the, the instruction part, the, um, the, way, the way to behave, the way, and the way to, uh, to meditate as well. So the first line is, just as devotion is taught to be the head of meditation, this meditator constantly prays to the Lama. So devotion is said to be the head of meditation because when natural devotion, and we're not talking about, oh, like, you know, you see a lot of people going all oh, kind of uh, holier than thou kind of attitude. No, and we're talking about genuine, authentic devotion that is born from a real feeling for an, an appreciation of the teacher, the lamas. The lamas also don't have to be somebody famous or with a lot of titles. It, can be, it doesn't even have to be a monk or a nun, it can be a lay person, but it has to be a genuine lama, it has to be an authentic lama that practices what they preach. It doesn't really preach, that's not really the right word, but <clears throat> and somebody who's definitely got your, your uh, benefit and well-being in, in mind. So when we have genuine devotion, then that opens our mind. And that's why it's said to be the head of meditation. Genuine devotion comes from trust, from looking, from, you know, don't just go for the first person because they, they, they've got a big name or they, you know, sit on a high throne or whatever, but someone who you really feel is, is helping and teaching you and guiding you. And, in, in, you know, it could be, whoever you feel that connection with. And so when you start to feel that trust, then, and then for the lineage, for the, for the, for the ones that you've read about, and all, all of these, these beings, they all kind of meld into each other, and, and, it, and it creates this feeling of, of uh, real faith and devotion. And so that's when you're, you really, your mind starts to open. So not in a, in a false kind of image way, but, but actual from the heart, you know. Actually, you know, when Tibetans point to the mind, we, we point to the mind here as if it's in the brain. They actually point to the heart region, where you feel. It's where you feel devotion. So it says the meditator, the practitioner, constantly prays to the Lama. Now, that doesn't mean to say that they're constantly praying like this, but they're in touch with the Lama. They think of the Lama there. They kind of, you become, you become, inseparable almost, you know, when, when, you, when you're tuned in, you know, when you're really tuned in, then it's become, you, you kind of become one with the Lama. Uh, the Lama who opens the vault of pith instructions. So there's different ways of learning, and the vault of pith instructions, again, we, we're in this bank, we actually have a vault here, it makes me think that's where we keep the pith instructions. But no, the pith instructions are what comes from the Lama's understanding to you. And 
So it's like opening this vault that's hitherto been closed. And when you're able to receive those, those instructions, those instructions come forth, spring forth. It's not that they're withheld, but, but you, you have to be open to receive them. So, so, you know, it's a gradual process. And so when you receive the, the pith instructions, and they happen in phase, it's not like all in one go, you know, it, it's a gradual thing. If you look at the way Marpa taught uh, Milarepa, or, uh, you know, it happens in stages, you don't go from sort of being Joe Bloggs to suddenly being the Buddha. You kind of have to sort of uh, go in the different levels, the different stages of the path. And so, and the, but when that starts to happen, then grant your blessings for uncontrived devotion to well forth. You know that it's a natural feeling, an, an, an unstoppable devotion just wells forth in gratitude, in appreciation, in love. And then the next verse, so now this is now becoming really the, um, the, the instruction for meditation. So it says, as non-distraction is taught to be the body of meditation. So we started with the legs of meditation, which was the distaste for the worldly life. Then we had the, the head of meditation, which is the devotion to the Lama. Now the actual meditation, the body of meditation, is non-distraction. So sit down to meditate. And what's the main body of thing that you need to do is, is to not be distracted. To be focused. A lot of nonsense gets talked about meditation, like it's some sort of thing that you just zone out and, and, uh, and, and just kind of like find your happy place or whatever, you know. It's not, it's really you need all your faculties sharp and awake, alert. Yes, relax, you don't want to be tense or anything, but it's about being aware, being not distracted by whatever comes up. You don't have to block anything either. You don't like, it's not that your thoughts suddenly disappear. You will still have thoughts, but you don't have to get distracted by them. You need to be able to rest in awareness. When you are distracted by them, then you notice it. So that's awareness, isn't it? So that's okay. It's when you're just distracted and get distracted and the next one, the next one, it snowballs to the next one, and then you're in this never-ending, ever-increasing, not just a snowball, it gets a massive snow man, woman, mountain, whatever, <laughs> it just increases. So as soon as you, you start to know that you're distracted, okay, you can celebrate that, you know you're distracted. So you leave the distraction where it was and you rest with the knowledge of your, your, your recognition of that distraction, the awareness that you need, that you keep, that you rest in. So as non-distraction is taught to be the body of meditation, this meditator simply remains without altering. You don't have to change. You just have to wake up. You remain. You don't have to, to, to try do this, that, and the other. You, you remain without altering. The fresh essence of whatever thought arises. It's not saying thoughts don't arise, that your mind suddenly goes like blank. Thoughts arise. It's a natural part of your mind, natural function of your mind. So you just resting, you notice, and you're resting in this fresh essence of whatever thought. Not the thoughts, you just let the thoughts come and go, but the essence of the thought. The essence is your mind. Where did the thoughts come from? They came from your mind. They didn't get put in by somebody coming to the, the room and put a, a thought in your mind. They came out of your mind. So you're resting in that essence of your mind. And thoughts come and go. Thoughts arise. There's a, an appearance of something or other, and then they disperse again. So without following each appearance as they come and go, you're aware of them, they come and go, but you're resting in the essence. 
It's a bit like if, you're, if your mind, and this is just a metaphor, so nothing can describe mind, but we'll have a go. <coughs> no, just <coughs> if, um, say, your mind is like the sea, like a, a vast ocean, and from that ocean, waves arise. Yeah, so for, for, for a few moments, a, a wave will arise, and then it's, we call it a wave. It's a thing, isn't it? It's a wave. Surfers go on them. We watch them. The, the, a, a wave arises, and then what happens? It falls back into the sea and becomes back into the sea again. It was never separate from the sea. It was just an, a, a mere appearance, a transitory appearance that was sea, looked like something, so we'll call that a wave, and then it went back into the sea from which it was never parted in the first place. So that's kind of like the thoughts and movements of your mind. So you don't have to get on, get on the thought like you're surfing endless thoughts and then another one and another one and another one. As soon as you realize you've been taken on the, on the surf you need, on, of your thought, then you need to come back. Rest in the ocean-like mind. Something like that. <clears throat> so, the fresh essence of whatever thought arises, grant your blessings for parting from the concept of meditation. Meditation is like this. Meditation is like that. I'm aiming for this. It's got to be like that. Oh, I've got to be really calm. I've got to be this. That's like making concept, conceptual, conceptualizing something which is actually a very natural state. And, and there's a lot of that about, the, of concept. In fact, most of what you'll get on the internet and the, and the uh, apps that you can get and all of this stuff is conceptualizing meditation. It's not meditation. It may be stress relieving or something, or, or mind blocking, thought blocking, whatever, or calming in some way, but it's not going to open your mind. It's not going to. We need to look at, at, the, at the mind, at the, at the thinker, not the thought. This is an inner journey, not an outer one, not relying on whale music or this or that or the other. We're going in. So grant your blessing, and you're asking them to grant your blessing for parting from the concept of meditation. And then, and we're getting very deep here. So just as thought is taught to be in essence dharmakaya, for this meditator, unhindered manifestation dawns. So thought is taught to be the essence of Dharmakaya. Dharmakaya is the mind of the Buddha, Buddha mind. It, so it comes from Buddha mind. There's nothing but Buddha mind. Everything is mind. So where else is it? It's like everything is seized, and whatever thoughts arise, they might, some of them are little ones, some of them are big ones, some of them are crash, some of them ripple, but they're all part of the mind. So just as thought is taught to be in essence, in essence, Dharmakaya, Vajradhara, the mind of Buddha, who we all are, mind. For this meditator, unhindered manifestation dawns. So by that it means that whatever manifests in our mind, leave it alone. Don't stick your oar in, because that's what then will lead to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Just look at it as it is. Unhindered means not interfering. Let it be. The minute we interfere, that's how the snowball starts getting bigger and bigger. You have one thought, you notice it, fine. Let it be. At some point, you have another thought. You, you may notice it. Fine. Let it be. You don't have to. For example, let's take another metaphor. Um, if your thoughts are a bit like 
a TV that's on, you know. You can have the TV on, it's in the background, you're not watching it. Or you can get hooked in and you're completely engrossed in the, in the television. I don't know how well that works as a metaphor, but anyway, it, it's what you need to be doing is looking at yourself here, your, at your, your, your mind, which is not a visible thing, but it manifests as thoughts, which kind of are visible in the, if we talk about the mind's eye. So it doesn't matter what they are. You, you don't have to judge them. You, you can, oh, this is a good one. I can have that. It's about meditation. It's a bit holy. Oh, that's fine. I'll have that one. Oh, no, I don't have that one. It's about partying. Maybe I shouldn't have that one. You know, it's not about good and bad. There's no good and bad in it. Thoughts are thought. And if you're trying to have a good thought, then, you, then you're not meditating. You're just trying. So there's, there's a contrivance that's not natural. Trust yourself as well, you know. Trust your natural state of awareness. So for this meditator, unhindered manifestation dawns. So it, it's like, ooh, wow, natural state. Don't have to do anything. Nothing whatsoever dawning as whatever may be. Whatever comes along doesn't matter. Don't have to judge it. Whatever comes up, whatever dawns, just leave it. You notice it, you're aware of it, and you don't need to interfere with it. Grant your blessings to realize inseparable samsara nirvana so samsara is this worldly life of suffering and all the worldly concerns and nirvana is the opposite it's the end of suffering it's what we call the the mind of enlightenment so free of suffering so we're asking for the, for the guru's blessing to realize the inseparability of these two. Now, how you might think, oh, okay, so, but they seem to be complete opposite, so how can they be inseparable? So, in my limited understanding, what, what I, I, I get from this is that um, when you've understood something, you see it completely differently. And so that, for example, say it's some sort of worldly thing, but, but through that worldly thing, you've come to understand it, and then you sort of see it for what it's worth. It, you, you, you see it in a completely different light. So that's like you have a different, it's the same thing, the thing is the same, but you have a very different understanding. You've kind of seen through it and, and have a, a different understanding. So the thing hasn't changed. So what was samsaric understanding has become um, a more enlightened view, you could say. But the thing has not changed, whatever the thing was. It's the way we see it. So then one becomes the other. They become inseparable. In fact, you could even say that samsara is like the fuel to bring about the understanding. So grant your blessings to realize inseparable samsara nirvana. Or I don't know if you've ever seen those paintings, sometimes you can get paintings that are two things at once, you know, like I've seen, remember seeing a, one of it's like a portrait of a woman, but it's made out of fruit. And you can't see them both at the same time. You can either see the fruit or you can see the woman, but not the fruit, but, the, but it's just the same painting. So it's something like that. You know, so the thing hasn't changed, but our way of seeing has changed. Inseparable, samsara nirvana. And then the next verse, may I never in future lives part from authentic lamas. So in, in all my future lives, in Buddhism we have this understanding of 
countless lives, beginningless, endless lives, different kinds of lives and different different realms maybe, but, but in whatever realms, in that future lives, may I always be with authentic lamas. Because through the lama that we understand the dharma, you know, it's said that the lama is, is more important in a way to, to us than, than the Buddha, the, the lama that, that teaches us, because it's through the lama that we get the Buddha's teachings anyway, more, you know, directly. So may I never, so then we have great love and respect and, and appreciation of the Lama. And so may I never be parted from the Lamas in, in my future lives. And may I always embrace, embrace ever the glory of Dharma. Dharma's become, we live the Dharma now because it's the truth. It's the body of truth. It's what's woken us up. It's our medicine. It's everything. So, so embrace the glory of Dharma genuine love of dharma and may i perfect the qualities of the levels and paths so may i may i may i follow the path of dharma may i perfect each each level as 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 i go and perfect the qualities of that level and then gradually increase my my understanding my realization my compassion my love and understanding all of these good qualities may i May, I, may they increase as I progress along the levels and paths. And thus swiftly attain the state of Vajradhara. Attain the state of Vajradhara means, Dorji Chang means Buddha mind. May I become Buddha. May I realize Buddha, the Buddha that I always was. and the swiftly attain the state of Vajradhara. Now, swiftly here, we have to understand that uh, we have to have a, a broad view, because even if we don't, we, we may not attain this in one lifetime. <laughs> That's very, very, very rare. It's not impossible, but it's very rare. But even if it takes 10 lifetimes, 100 lifetimes, that's still relatively swift. So we have a broad view, you know. But uh, anyway, the swiftly attain the state of Vajradhara. And in the Kaju lineage, you know, we have the, 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 the Vajrayana, which is a more direct route and uh, relatively swift. So become the Buddha that we, we truly are, become the state of Vajradhara. So that, that last verse is, is kind of like the aspiration. You know, all the previous ones have been please grant the blessing for this to happen, for this to happen. And then may I never in future lives part from authentic lamas, authentic is the key word here, and embrace ever the glory of Dharma, my perfect the qualities of the levels and paths and the swiftly attain Buddhahood. So there we have it. That's the Dorji Chan Tungma or the brief Vajradhara prayer. Uh, but to really get the feeling from it, you know what, what? We usually do this before a teaching or before a meditation. It, it's really good to actually chant it. Um, so I think it would be good to chant it together, and um, and we'll do it in English, obviously. Now that we've gone through it, you have some idea of the meaning, and it will grow. It will grow on you. You know, the more you can use this for your meditation. You know, just meditate on one line or one verse. You know. And, uh, and leave it at that because, as I was saying before, it is extremely profound and, and it will gradually over time reveal itself. So, um, and the other thing is, I think it would be nice to do the um, with the melody because it, it gives it more feeling. There's a nice melody that comes with it. Uh, but the, the melody has, you have to kind of go for it a bit because um, it's it sort of got quite a big range. So, we'll have a go anyway. It's. Um, and I think it does sort of wake up the heart. You know, it's like you're using your body, speech, and mind, not just kind of reading. And then I think just to finish with, because we're getting, we're running, uh, kind of getting towards the end, I think we'll just l let it lead into a meditation. So this will be the guidance of the meditation. There won't be anything between the, the, uh, the prayer 
uh, uh, the lineage prayer, and then we'll just meditate. And it's probably just going to be for um, probably just going to be for a very few minutes, but uh, but still, we'll we'll concentrate on the on the quality rather than the quantity. Better five minutes of uh, focused, aware meditation than uh, an hour of daydreaming. So, just wet my whistle first. Okay, so we um, sit in a good, good uh, meditation posture, and uh, we're just going to be completely natural. Remember, we're not going to do some conceptual meditation. We're going to be awareness. So we start with the lineage prayer. Our great Vajra Dara Tilo Naro Mar Pamila Dharma Lord Gampopa Knower of the three times Omniscient Karmapa Holders of the four elder and eight younger lineages Drekung Taklung and the Salpa Glorious Drukpa and so forth Masters of the profound path of Mahamudra To the dark poe instruction lineage The peerless protectors of wanderers Kajulamas, I supplicate you, I uphold your lineage. Grant the blessings of your liberating lives. Just as revulsion is taught to be the legs of meditation, this meditator clings not to food and riches and has severed the ties to this life. Grant your blessings for detachment from honor and gain. Just as devotion is taught to be the head of meditation, this meditator constantly prays to the Lama, who opens the vault of pith instructions. Grant your blessings for uncontrived devotion to well forth. Just as non-distraction is taught to be the body of meditation, this meditator simply remains without altering the fresh essence of whatever thought arises. Grant your blessings for parting from the concept of meditation. Just as thought is taught to be in essence Dharmakaya, for this meditator unhindered manifestation dawns. Nothing whatsoever dawning as whatever may be. Grant your blessings to realize inseparable samsara nirvana. May I never in future lives part from authentic lamas and embracing ever the glory of Dharma. May I perfect the qualities of the levels and paths and thus swiftly attain the state of Vajradhara.
So, I know that was a, a very short meditation, but hopefully it was a, um, gave something of, of what we've been talking about, that you, know, that you rest in awareness. And like I was saying, even just a few minutes awareness, even just a few seconds awareness, is something you can build on. You know, rather than, uh, sometimes we can sit for hours and just be completely distracted the whole time. So if you've got, if you know what it is like, if you have that feeling of, of uh, awareness, you know that you, you can rest in that. And then you can gradually increase that. And whenever you see yourself getting distracted, come back to that. Don't judge yourself, don't beat yourself up about having thoughts. Just come back to that state of natural uncontrived peace and awareness of mind, your mind. That's what, that's what this is all about. So we'll finish now with the dedication prayer and we'll uh, use the phonetics for that, um, which you have, I think, somewhere. I've got them as well. I just want to make sure I've got the same version, but uh, yeah. Okay, so, so we dedicate the merit of our practice to benefit all sentient beings. Whatever our practice does will be benefit us, of course, but we dedicate it, we're not possessive about it, we share it with all sentient beings. O sanam de tam che sig pani, top ne ne pe danam pam che ne, jiga na chi balav du pai, Sipe sole do ado arsho. Okay, so um, I hope that's been useful for you. Um, this prayer you ha is online, and so you can download it if you if you wish. And uh, I would recommend you to do so. Always keep it clean and, and in a good place, you know, don't let it fall on the floor, that kind of thing, because this it represents the, the words of the Buddha, so we keep it, we give it, you know, respect. And um, also, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seven verses, you could use this for meditation, you could, there's one for each day of the week, isn't there? So, um, so you, could, you could use the first verse and meditate on that, go into the depth of it, because we've really just skimmed it. You know, we've gone through it in an hour, an hour and a half, whatever. Um, so, so, you know, you can use it for meditation, and that way your understanding will increase. So you're using it for study, contemplation, and meditation. And then you can say the prayer and chant it. Um, and, uh, and hopefully you'll get some understanding and, and, and inspiration from it. And um, also, well, we're going to be um, hopefully meeting again here, um, if not in person, then in, in the way that we are now. And uh, in any future t teachings that there are, we will start the, the, the teachings with this prayer uh, because it, it's the ideal way for setting the mind in the right in the right frame, the, also for the body and, and speech, everything, it, it uh, gives the right kind of frame. Um, I think what we'll probably be doing in about a month's time, um, I'll be starting with the, the four ways of turning the mind to Dharma. So this is where we're really starting to walk the path. Um, some of you may have done this, th th this course before because it's the foundation of, of the of Mahamudra, actually, the foundation preliminaries of, of Mahamudra. I've done it many, many times. I've been to many, many teachings on it, and I've taught it myself many times. And every time I hear it or teach it, I get something new. I get something deeper, higher. Um, so just because you've done it before, don't feel, oh, you can tick it off your list. You know, really, there's so much profundity in there. In fact, I remember one of my first teachers when, uh, oh, going back 20 odd years ago, saying, you know, if you really get the preliminaries, if you really understand these foundations, the four ways of turning the mind to Dharma, you don't actually need any other teachings because they have it all. So, so really, we can never really do it enough. Anyway, I think that's what we'll probably be doing um, in February and, uh, and from then onwards. So, um, so yes, uh, in the meantime, um, I hope everything goes well for you. I hope you use what you know it's been useful and that you use it well and um and yeah just be
be, be natural about it, be safe, be careful, be well, and, uh, and be joyful. Until next time. <laughs>